Anaximander, another Milesian philosopher, proposed a different approach to the one and the many, a different single underlying monistic substance. According to Anaximander, the single underlying monistic substance is the boundless. In Greek, apiron, spelled A-P-E-I-R-O-N, looks like ape iron, but uh, the correct pronunciation is apiron. At any rate, in English, it's generally rendered as the boundless. Now, what is the boundless like? Well, it's notoriously difficult to describe because according to Anaximander, he says it has no qualities. It's not located in space. It has no smell. It has no shape. It has no physical features. Well, what is it? It is unlimited. It is indefinite. In fact, the um, most literal translation of apiron, I believe, is indefinite. Well, if it's indefinite, what can we say about it? Not much. In fact, less than that, nothing. So Anaximander's monism asks of us really something that we, we can't do. It asks of us to think of the single underlying substance as something that we can't really think of. So it's, it's very puzzling that Anaximander asks us to think of the boundless not only as a monistic principle, but as a material monistic principle, but it's something that is fundamentally unthinkable. One cannot wrap one's head around it. I will come to some problems regarding the boundless momentarily, but before we get there, I'd just like to talk about um, how Anaximander thought the boundless underlay change becoming. That is how it worked for him as not just an answer to the problem of the one and the many, but as an answer to the problem of change. Now, again, we, we're up against the problem that um, is not uncommon when dealing with the pre-Socratics. All we have of their writings are fragments. We don't have whole works. So the author of the uh, Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on the pre-Socratics, uh, Jacob Graham, says this, when it comes to the boundless giving rise to particulars, Graham writes, this everlasting principle gave rise to the cosmos by generating hot and cold, each of which separated off, he has that in quotes, from the boundless. He goes on, how it is that this separation took place is unclear, but we might presume that it happened via the natural force of the boundless. Other um, writers about the pre-Socratics that I have read have spoken of Anaximander conceiving the boundless as a whirling mass that flung opposites out. So, for example, the whirling, which I imagine is what Graham might think of as the force of the boundless, the whirling separates out the opposites found in nature, hot, cold, for example, dark, light, as another example, dry, wet, as yet another example. The boundless flings these out. But wait, does the boundless have qualities or doesn't it? If it's whirling, then it's in motion and being in motion is a quality. Even if one is to be a bit more vague about what the boundless is doing as it flings out these opposites, if it has a force unto itself, that's a quality as well. Indeed, if it's doing anything, then it's got to have some kind of qualities. But Anaximander has said, that it doesn't have qualities, no qualities by which it can be described, no qualities by which it can be understood. Well, here we have a big problem with both Anaximander's theory of change, answer to the problem of change, as well as his answer to the problem of the one and the many. And that problem resides in him making apparently simultaneous claims 
that the boundless both has qualities and does not have qualities. That is not a tenable position. If, in fact, that's what he was committed to, and no one really knows for sure, if that's what he was committed to, then that's not a tenable position. That's not a, an internally coherent position. In fact, it seems an awful lot like a logical contradiction. A logical contradiction is a claim of incompatible characteristics about one and the same thing at the same time. If the boundless both has no qualities and has the quality of motion or force, well, those cannot be had at the same time. It seems as if Anaximander has contradicted himself. And for that reason, we need to reject the idea of the boundless as the root monistic principle. So does this mean that Anaximander's philosophy was entirely worthless? I don't think so. The value that Anaximander brought that is worth remembering is that he considered that the root monistic principle, the underlying factor that would explain the variety of things that we see, is something that we don't see. Anaximander proposed that there can be something real and underlying and important to the things that we observe that is something different than those things. That is, there may be something underlying what we experience that is responsible for it, and something of a different kind, something unlike that which we observe. And of course, as science developed, it has come to be known that there exist particles that don't in any way resemble the particulars that we observe that make them up. So while the underlying physical material level of reality is really nothing like what Anaximander imagined, and indeed, well, that's not, that's not shocking since there's no way of really understanding what the boundless is said to be like. In fact, it's not really said to be like anything. The concept is vague, and that's problematic if it's offered as an explanation. Nonetheless, the important part is that it can make sense to look for underlying aspects of reality that are not like the things that we observe. Thank you.